Trolls are bestial giants driven by unrelenting hunger, occupying a niche between animal predator and the rest of giant kind. These rubber-skinned brutes prize strength, and they lost for slaughter and destruction, caring little for anything else. Secure in the knowledge that most creatures cannot inflict lasting injuries on them, they fight fearlessly. And let's go over, as always, to the monster manual and first see what they tell us about these creatures. It says here that they're born with horrific appetites. Trolls eat anything that they can catch and devour. They have no society to speak of, but they do serve as mercenaries to orcs, ogres, edens, hags, and giants. As payment, trolls demand food and treasure. Now, trolls are difficult to control, however, doing as they please, even when working with more powerful creatures. A couple of notes though here is that trolls actually do have a bit of culture to them and they do gather in tribes, albeit fairly small ones, so to say that they have no society to speak of is a bit misleading. There's also a reason why trolls gather coin and treasure, though it doesn't seem like they mention it here in the monster manual, but we will cover those later on, let's keep going. It says here that smashing a troll's bones and slashing through its rubbery hide only makes it angry. A troll's wounds close quickly. If the monster loses an arm, leg, or even a head, those dismembered parts can sometimes act with a life of their own. A troll can even reattach several body parts, untroubled by its momentary disability. Only acid and fire can arrest the regenerative properties of the troll's flesh. The trolls, enraged, will attack individuals making acid and fire attacks against them above all other prey. Continuing on, it says here that their regenerative capabilities make trolls especially susceptible to mutation. Although uncommon, such transformations can result from what the troll has done or what has been done to it. A decapitated troll might grow two heads from the stump of its neck, while a troll that eats a fey creature might gain one or more of the creature's traits. This here, in my opinion, is probably the coolest part of the troll, and I'm very happy that they finally added it to the lore of the creature, because believe it or not, this is the first time they have actually put this in writing, as far as I can see. Trolls mutate ferociously, and that's actually the reason why you see so many different kinds of them, with different abilities, from the feared two-headed trolls, to the ice trolls, to the desert trolls, to even the scrags, the water trolls. In any case, down here we got a chart that tells us what happens when you cut off a limb from a troll, since the dismembered limbs will continue on fighting as if they had a will of their own. A severed arm can still claw and choke, whereas a severed head can still bite. It does say here though, very important, that parts regrow in either a short rest or a long rest, whereas the process of reattaching a body part is actually almost instantaneous as long as the severed piece is placed by the knob. Then here we have the stat block for the troll, though there is nothing too crazy in here. They are apparently really good at smelling, which is probably where the proficiency in perception comes from. They regenerate 10 points of health a turn, which is insane, and the only way to block it is via acid or fire. Lastly, we can see the reason why these fairly intelligent creatures refuse to use weapons, and that's because their claws are actually as strong as blades, dealing 2d6 dice of damage per strike. Pretty insane. Now let's talk about what the monster manual does not tell you about trolls. First of all, let's actually describe the creature. This happens very often in 5th edition entries for monsters that we don't actually get an official description of how the monster is actually supposed to look like. Typically we just have to rely on the picture given, which is not always 100% reliable. Quote, their frame appears thin and frail, but trolls possess surprising strength. Their arms and legs are long and ungainly. The legs end in great three-toed feet, their arms in wide, powerful hands with sharpened claws. The troll's rubbery hide is colored moss green, mottled green and gray, or putrid gray. A writhing, hair-like mass grows out of their skulls and is usually greenish, black, or iron gray in color. Their dull, sunken black eyes possess 90-foot infravision. Trolls walk upright but hunched forward with sagging shoulders. The troll's gait is uneven and, when running, the arms dangle free and drag along the ground. For all this seeming awkwardness, trolls are very agile. They are masterful climbers and can scale even sheer cliffs with an 80% chance of success. They have poor hearing but their senses of smell is superior." End quote. 
See, the reason why I think descriptions are important is because now we can see that what trolls grow on their head is not actually hair, but odd writhing growths. If you look at some of the older depictions of the D&D troll, you can see it more clearly how it's supposed to look like. Official D&D art illustrations tend to be pretty good at catching that, but fan art will sometimes miss it. Unfortunate as it is, there isn't a lot of art for the trolls, so I might have to use stuff that is not 100% correct, but it is what it is. Trolls in D&D are supposed to be skinny, and they're supposed to look very frail, but most depictions of trolls in fantasy culture are more like ogres. If you look at this picture, which is a, a great representation of the range of trolls, D&D trolls are more like this than anything else. They're really skinny and lanky with their arms dragging on the ground. But anyways, a, a typical troll stands about 9 feet tall and weighs around 500 pounds. They are huge, which comes partly from their far giant ancestry. The monster Minel doesn't tell you, but the natural lifespan of the troll is about 100 years, and they reach maturity after just 10. In fact, they can hunt and fend for themselves as early as in one year of age. This comes from the fact that trolls are virtually immortal, as long as they're not afflicted by fire or acid, including of course being swallowed alive, since then they would have to deal with the stomach acids, which work in the same way, they can basically just live forever. The young trolls learn mostly through harsh experience since they can afford to, and the only thing that they're taught to fear by their parents is of course mostly fire. When it comes to the wild, they have no natural predators, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things out there that aren't more than happy to attack and eat the trolls. The only monsters out there that give a troll pause tend to be the Ankex, the dragons, oozes, remoraces, and of course, the purple worms. Creatures that naturally produce either acid or fire, or creatures that can straight up just swallow them whole. Interestingly enough, the lore says that trolls do tend to fear incorporeal undead, creatures like shadows or ghosts who can kill a troll through non-standard means. Outside of these very specific things though, trolls are said to never feel fear, and they prey on all but the most powerful of creatures. When it comes to most creatures in the world, this is typically very easy since trolls are, again, basically immortal. But when it comes to stronger or more organized enemies like humans, they do this by traveling in small packs of 3 to 12 trolls. Let's actually talk a little bit about troll society, which the Monster Manual specifically refused to talk about for some reason, but it's actually very interesting. Most troll gatherings are led by a dominant female, which acts as a shifton slash shaman. See, the monster manual didn't tell you, but the female trolls are very easy to distinguish from the males, but the fact that they are much bigger and much stronger. Trolls live in mostly matriarchal societies where the strong typically rule, so for the most part, females tend to lead these gatherings. Clans of trolls are, by the very nature of their being, chaotic and unruly. Trolls typically don't do well on their servitude and require constant harsh punishment for obedience. This is just based on how they have evolved psychologically thanks to the fact that nothing but fire and acid can stop a troll from getting what it wants. This is why leadership in these clans is only retained by combat, so fights for control are very frequent. Quote, Often trolls rend each other limb from limb, but these battles are never fatal. Still, it is the custom of trolls to toss the loser's head a great distance from the fight scene, and frequently losers must sit and stew for a week until the new head grows in. The pact Shifton's duties are few. She leads the trolls on nightly forages, loping along, sniffing the air for prey. If a scent is found, the trolls charge, racing to get there first and letting out a great cry once the prey is spotted. In return for being the hunt leader, the shaman gets her choice of mates in the pack. End quote. It's interesting though that in spite of the fact that the strong rule and the leading female gets to choose her mate, there is still a mating ritual that involves a courtship process. Typically the female will hunt a great meal and then present her intended with the meal for them both to share, something that is typically never seen otherwise in troll culture. Trolls are very greedy and solitary creatures for the most part and they never share a meal, so these types of mating rituals only happen in times when food is very 
very plenty. Especially so since a pregnant female is particularly more hungry and vicious than normal. Because of all of this, typically trolls mate irregularly, so you will only see this on average maybe once every five years. And when it does happen, the year-long gestation period will only yield a single baby troll. This is the reason why you don't see hordes of trolls in the very same way you might see hordes of orcs or goblins. I mean, you do, but it's much, much rarer. They reproduce very, very slowly. Now, this type of dominance that females show over others for mating is also present in other aspects of troll life. In fact, asserting dominance over weaker members of the tribe through violence is most often than not the only way in which a troll can express itself in their society. Trolls don't really craft or perform any form of agriculture. The pastimes in this group of monsters are scarce and they mostly just hunt and beat each other up. It's all they do. Though very rarely you do actually get to see the occasional troll that develops an interest in cave painting. You will typically see this done in either charcoal, blood, clay, or even filth, and will usually depict scenes of hunts or wars, and often they will share depictions of the dark gods that they worship. This is rare though, since most trolls won't even bother making crude garments to cover themselves. But it does happen. Now, intertribal relations can be very interesting because seldom can groups of trolls actually kill each other thanks to their abilities. Two tribes fighting each other would yield no results except for waste time and a lot of suffering. So instead, they have developed complex ritualistic offerings between different clans in order to keep each other happy and away. They actually trade males between the clans, sometimes as marriage alliances and other times just as a form of fosterage. You might even see trades where the clan will trade in a male for treasure or magical items. They do this in order to keep each other happy. Most clans do not trespass on another's territory for this very reason. To this point, it is very interesting that even though trolls have no actual need for treasure, as in they don't really go out to trade it for things, they still do enjoy collecting it. This is because to trolls, they see treasure as a measure of their worth. The more treasure you have, the more powerful you are, or the more you're worth, or the smarter you are. Very similar in that way to how dragons see their horde. Now some trolls feel this way so strongly that they might even sell their power for gold in mercenary clans. Something very scary whenever it happens. Since trolls don't particularly write, their culture and history is maintained through oral tradition, including their language. But because of how messy their oral tradition is, because of the fact that they are below average in intellect, because of the fact that they are also a fairly nomadic group that constantly trades in males to other troll cultures, their language is actually scuffed. Trolls speak what many have gone to call troll speak, which is really just a glutteral sounding amalgamation of many different languages put together, including common, giant, goblin, orc, and even hobgoblin. It is said that trolls only have about a 25% chance of understanding any other particular society of trolls from another region. So when the 5th edition Monster Manual tells you that they speak giant, it's really more like they speak 25% giant. It's a very broken giant. The history that they teach each other and their young typically revolves around religious beliefs shared by the clan. Beliefs that can be different depending on the region. Most clans though typically attribute a divine origin to the founder of their respective group. Typically female, she is usually called the Great Mother and the trolls will associate her as a daughter of Baprak, god of trolls. Regardless of whether it is true or not, trolls will live on believing that they can trace their lineage back through the clan all the way back to Vaprak in one way or another, and they actually gain great pride from that. Furthermore, they believe themselves to be superior to the other giant races because they feel that they have, quote, maintained their connection to the primal chaotic forces of the earth by emulating its ability to destroy and regenerate, end quote. In fact, several troll and even giant mythologies speak of elder gods that are no longer actively worshipped, some of which trolls still teach to their young up to this day. Most of these focus on the existence of a dark earth mother. Now to finish off the video, let's talk a little bit about the great regenerative process of the troll. It's interesting that the speed at which trolls regenerate is actually up for debate, mostly because the actual numbers are all over the place. 
See, when it comes to just normal HP regeneration, it's pretty standard. Most trolls regenerate about 10% of their health every turn. That has typically never changed since first edition. What has changed though is the speed at which a troll can grow back a limb. In fifth edition it says here that all it takes is either a short rest or a long rest and a troll can completely grow back a missing piece. In first edition it only took 3 to 13 rounds for a piece to completely regrow. In second edition it took a whole week for a piece to grow back. And then in third edition it says right here that it takes about 3 to 6 minutes for a piece to regrow. It's interesting that the lore is just so varied on this topic. Very rare to see this level of variance between editions on something very objective like this. In all editions, however, a troll can instantaneously piece back a limb that was cut off by simply putting the limb up to the knob to get it reformed back immediately. And that has definitely not changed. One thing though that is important that the Monster Manual doesn't tell you in this regard though is that in the case that a troll is completely dismembered and all of the pieces are scattered to the winds, it is then the larger piece that will become the main piece. And then that piece will be the one growing back into the full troll, whereas the other pieces will simply wither away. It is truly incredible the power of troll's blood, which by the way, is worth a small fortune. The amount of blood that you can gather from a single troll body is worth around 400 gold pieces thanks to its great healing potential. In fact, it is very common to use the blood in order to make both poison antidotes and potent healing potions. It is said that typically with the amount of green blood that one can harvest from a single troll, it is generally possible to make about three such potions. I would like to personally thank my patron supporters Walker Motley, Zach Bowell, Rocato Fan, Barry Maskand, 5E Magic Shop, Daniel Umar, Rusty Rain, Morgan Johnson, Biotechnofrag, Daniel Luna, Doc Feeder, Brad Salazar, The Great Codini, Terry Culp, Barakis Law, Omega Scales, Karathas the Bulwark, Osol, Sound Tech, Siri, Alice Cookson, Square Chicken, Ariel Nelson, Benjamin Busters. IO is awesome, Falky951, Jacob Krasid, Griffin Pierce, and Serum King for supporting me on Patreon at the $25 level. If you would like to support me as well, then please head on over to patreon.com slash MrRex to support. Alright guys, we're still going strong, don't worry, I'm, I'm not gonna burn out, at least it doesn't feel like it, I, I do enjoy making the videos, it's a lot of work, but... I'm, I'm hanging on, I think I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. If I start burning out, I, I promise you I will slow down, but so far, things appear to be good, so we'll keep going for as long as we can. <laughs> Anyways guys, I'll see you in a couple of days, thank you once again for watching and I'll see you then.